to see all of you now that I've got your attention. <laughs> well, this morning we are continuing our series, Can We Talk About This in Church? Politics. The title of the message today, this morning, is Whose Side Is God On? Now, maybe some of you, as you're thinking about voting here in a couple of days, or already have made that decision, already done that, um, maybe you've been asking this question and wondering this and praying about this. Whose side is God on? There's also a really good chance that you've already answered the question. God's on my side, right? The way that I'm voting, the person that I'm voting for, this is how God would vote. This is who God would vote for. But is he on your side? Is that how Jesus would vote? I want to just remind you of some things that we have been learning in this series. One of those things is the importance of the Lord's Prayer. And so I want to ask you to join with me, if you would, in praying this prayer before we dive in. Let's pray this prayer out loud together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Great prayer. This prayer helps us when it comes to the topic of politics. To remember who's really in charge. And to remember whose kingdom we belong to. Some words that we talked about last week that I want to remind you of. The first is the word politics. Politics, we said last week, is not a bad thing. It's not an evil thing. It's not the work of the devil. Though certainly he can work in it. But politics just simply means how people rule. It's the life of the public. And God created us to be in charge. How many of you like being in charge? Okay, okay. thank you for the honesty back there. We all like to be in charge. God knew that. That's a part of, maybe we'd say the fruit of being made in God's image and likeness. Is that we get to rule this planet. The things that happen on this planet. We get to decide laws, make laws. Because God has trusted us with that. So being political and living politically is a part of living into the image and likeness of God. It's how he made us. Another important word for us to know is this word partisan. It's got the word part in there. So if you can remember that, then you can get the word. It means that you favor a person, a political party, or a cause. You're partial to something. We see a lot of partisan politics going on in our country, don't we? And sometimes we're the ones that suffer when partisan politics are played. And then finally, last week we talked about the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? It's simply God's reign and rule. It's where what God wants done gets done. And last week the title of the message was, The Kingdom is Greater Than Politics. So simply put, God's way of doing things, God's will is greater than man's or woman's. You believe that, church? Jesus told us in Matthew 6, that we are to seek first, above everything else in life, God's way of doing things. God's reign and rule. That's to be our number one priority. And Jesus also told us last week in Matthew 13, 44, that the kingdom of God, that God's reign and rule is so valuable that when it's discovered, someone might sell everything that they have to go and to purchase it and to be under it and to be a part of it and to have it in their lives. Is that true for you, church? Are you that excited about God's reign and rule as you are about a particular presidential candidate or political party? We're called to put the kingdom of God above any other kingdom. So with that said, whose side is God on in this mess? 
Whose side is God on in our country when it comes to sorting out who should be president, who should be vice president, who should be in charge of this, who should be in charge of that? Well, I want to direct your eyes and your ears to the scriptures. If you'll take your Bibles and open those up to the Old Testament book of Joshua, the sixth book of the Old Testament, the book of Joshua, we're going to look at a passage of scripture in Joshua chapter 5. Paul, I know you're excited about this. My brother Paul loves the book of Joshua. It's his favorite book in the Bible. So he is really getting excited that we're talking about Joshua this morning. Joshua chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 13, 14, and 15. I'm going to put this passage up on the screen for you as well, but I want to kind of set the context for what's going on here in Joshua chapter 5. Joshua is Moses' successor. He was mentored by Moses as a young boy. And Joshua was chosen by God to take a new generation of the Israelites into the new promised land. You see, God, he had chosen Joshua to be a servant, to lead God's chosen people into God's chosen land. And Joshua was taking this new generation in because the old generation, listen to this church, the old generation said, hey, we are interested in what, the, what new thing God is doing. We want things the old way. And they kept saying that over and over and over again. They said, God, we know you've got a new direction and a new plan and a new land for us, but we kind of like things the way they were. And so a whole generation wandered in the wilderness of sin. A whole generation passed away because they weren't willing to say, God, where you go, I will go. How many of you would be willing to tell God that? Where you go, I will go. So Joshua and this new generation of Israelites, they've come to the edge of the promised land and there before them is the Jordan River. And very similar to Moses and the Israelites crossing through the Red Sea, the Israelites, as they step down into the Jordan River, the river is dammed up and they cross through the river. They pass through the river into the promised land. Joshua leads them into the promised land. They walk through a river as a sign, as a testimony to God's promise coming true to God's miraculous power at work. And one of the first things that they're going to do in this promised land is they are going to take the city of Jericho. Jericho is a walled city. It's a fortified city. It, it looks like it'd be pretty difficult. And so as a smart and courageous leader of the warriors of the Israelites, Joshua is out one day or one night or one morning, it doesn't tell us, and he's scouting out Jericho. He's taking a look at what they're going to go up against. And as he's doing that, he thinks he's alone when all of a sudden there's somebody else there with him. Somebody else appears and guess what? They've got a sword. Let's pick up the story. Let's read this together. Beginning in verse 13. It says, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Are you going to vote Democrat or Republican? Verse 14. Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? Verse 15, the commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And jo Joshua did so. You know, sometimes there are passages, verses, stories in the Bible that hit you like a speed bump. You ever hit a speed bump a little bit too hard? I was in another state with the family and the van driving <clears throat> this particular state. They did not paint their speed bumps yellow. Can you believe that? I'm used, anybody else used to a yellow speed bump? I mean, yellow, slow down, there's a speed bump here. 
This state didn't believe in that. It was the same color as the road. Now, there were signs, but I ignored those. <laughs> Hit this puppy pretty hard. It jolted us, and it shook us up. I think by the end of it, I was in the back of the van. Eli was up in the front seat. It was just, it was shocking. It was just like out of nowhere. This passage of Joshua reminds me a lot of a speed bump. I mean, let's just think about this for a second. Joshua, he knows God's with him. He's leading God's people. And then he has this encounter with what we come to find out is probably a pre-incarnate Jesus. This is probably a Christophany. It's what we would call this. Jesus showing up. You know, as a church, as Christians, we believe that Jesus didn't come into existence 2,000 years ago. Jesus has always been in existence. He just took on flesh 2,000 years ago and made his dwelling among us. So it makes sense from time to time in the Old Testament, Jesus shows up. And he shows up as what looks like a guy holding a sword. And Joshua, you have to appreciate Joshua's bravery and his courageousness. I don't know about you, but if I'm out by myself and somebody shows up with a gun or with a sword, I'm going to quickly disappear. Joshua just walks right up to the guy. Hey, what's going on? Whose side are you on, buddy? I think Joshua has an idea who this might be. And wouldn't you just love to be able to see Joshua's expression? To see how Joshua responds when he says, hey, are you for us? Are you on our side or are you on the side of our enemies? Are you for us or against us? And the person responds, no. I kind of wish Joshua would have broken up his questions a little better. Like Joshua, start with one question. Are you for us? Give the dude time to answer. And then say, hey, are you against us? And give him time to answer. But Joshua rolled those questions into one. Maybe it's an issue of translation. I'm reading to you from the NIV. Maybe we need something a little more literal to help us better understand what's being said here. So let's take the NASB version of this same passage of scripture. Joshua asks, are you for us or for our adversaries? This is going to clear it up. He said, no. No. How about a little bit more uh, newer literal translation like the ESV? Surely this will clear things up. Are you for us? Now they have to come. We're on a good track. I think we're going to get an answer. Are you for us, comma, or for our adversaries? And he said, no. Let's go old school. Let's go KJV. Surely that will clear things up for us. Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, nay. <laughs> you ever just give somebody a big fat nay? <laughs> so what is the point of this text? What is the point of this speed bump in the story of Joshua and the Israelites going into the promised land, doing what they've been asked to do, doing what they feel they've been led to do? What's the point of this? Has God just brought Joshua in to kind of pull one over on him? Oh, hey, Joshua, you guys fell for it. Classic. Gotcha. Gotcha. I'm actually not on your side. This was just a big joke on you guys. Now, Joshua knows that he was chosen by God. He knows God is with him. I think what's going on here is Jesus showing up to Joshua is challenging Joshua, which is also challenging us because we have the story here to think bigger. To think bigger. Because no is not the only. No is not the only answer that Joshua gets. Did you catch the rest of what this pre-incarnate Jesus says? No, neither, nay. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have come. I'm here. I'm here. And Joshua does the best thing possible. The scriptures tell us there in verse 14... It says, Joshua fell down to the ground. Fell down to the ground with reverence, with worship. And he asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? What message does my Lord have for his servant? You see, Joshua, 
How God is helping him think bigger than just, hey, it's us versus them. God is asking Joshua to rejoice and to celebrate and to acknowledge the fact that he has shown up, that he's present, that he's given Joshua his presence, that he's with them. You know, if you think about the story of Job in the Bible, Job suffered an innumerable amount of pain and loss in his life. And he tried to figure it out. He tried to reason through what was going on. His friends tried to explain what was going on. But ultimately, none of that worked. It all fell short until God showed up. God shows up and Job is just blown away. And you know what? You know what's really interesting about the ending of the book of Job? Job never gets the answer to why he had to deal with the things he dealt with. He never gets the answer. And he seems totally fine with that because Job, what he really got, what he really needed was God himself. That's what you need. That's what the world needs. That's what the church needs. That's what the lost needs is God himself, God's presence for us to realize that God is here with us. Are you making a note of that right now, church? That God is here in our midst. He inhabits our praise. He's with us this morning. Is that enough for you? God is challenging Joshua to think bigger. To think, I, what, I, what I really need more than anything is God's presence. What I really need to do when God shows up is to worship. You know, worship Worship is really a refocusing of our mind, a refocusing of our thoughts, a refocusing of our vision onto what's important. And for us as believers, what's important is Jesus. That's who we're called to worship. That's who Joshua falls down and worships. That's why I believe this is Jesus here, because this, this being, this person allows Joshua to worship him. And then he says something very similar to what God told Moses in the burning bush encounter. Hey, take off your shoes. Hey, take off your sandals because the ground beneath you has become holy. When God shows up, when God's presence is near, when God's presence takes a hold of your life, you can become holy because God is there and God is holy. You see, we're called to think bigger than just a us versus them. You know, I really think that Joshua is receiving a message here that is very similar to the message I shared with you last week. God is saying, my reign and rule, my way of doing things is greater than man's, is greater than woman's. And maybe just to make sure that Joshua really gets it, we're going to follow this up with the story of how the Israelites took Jericho. And think about what happened in that story. If you're, if you're a military person, if you have a military mindset, you probably, that, that story of how the Israelites took Jericho just doesn't make sense. They basically went for a walk and conquered the city of Jericho. All like, you know, how does that happen? I mean, what if our military leader said, hey, we've got a problem over in, in this country. We're going to gather the Christians, we're going to go over and we're going to walk around it. Totally crazy. Totally out there. But I think God is getting a message to Joshua that his kingdom is greater than any military campaign that you're going to go on. His kingdom, his reign and rule is different than any kind of military campaign you're going to run. Trust me, Joshua. Trust me. There's also a reminder in this, too, I think, that our real enemy is not flesh and blood. We do not battle against flesh and blood. I want you to say that with me. Would you say that with me? We do not battle against flesh and blood. Let's say it again together, church. We do not battle against flesh and blood. Let's say it one more time. We've got to get it. We do not battle against flesh and blood. Think about what Paul says in Ephesians chapter, chapter 6. Our struggle, it's not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In other words, our enemy is an unseen enemy. Our enemy is not the person sitting next to us today. Our enemy is not the person that's going to go and vote differently than us on Tuesday. Our enemy is something we can't see. Is someone we can't see. But by faith, we can believe that that enemy is there. And by faith, we can believe that Jesus is the conqueror. That Jesus has claimed the victory over that enemy. And through Jesus and in Jesus, 
You are victorious. You know, what if, what if church were thinking incorrectly about all this side stuff? What if we're missing the bigger picture? What if, what if we're asking the wrong question? What if it's not so much about whose side is God on as it is about maybe asking ourselves whose side am I on? Or asking what Joshua asked. What message does my Lord have for his servant? Pastor Tony Evans gave an analogy that I to me, it really hit home. To me, it really made things click and helped me understand how to think about this whole question of whose side is God on. And I want to share that with you. Can I share that with you, church? Okay? You okay with that? You're going to get it anyways, whether you're ready or not. I hope I do it justice because I know Pastor Tony Evans will be listening to me this week. And I want to make sure I do it right. So I hope I do it right. He used the analogy of a football game. I think this resonates with us. We have a lot of football fans here, up here at Elkhart Northside. We have a lot of college football fans, Notre Dame fans. We are up here near Mecca. And so, you know, that's, you got to cheer for Notre Dame. You guys might have to convert over. I don't know. I don't know. We have, uh, we have Michigan fans. We have some Michigan fans, Wolverines, and Michigan State. Helping me with my point, Andrew. 
Again, their presence, the presence of referees ensures that a fair game is going to be played. And just to make sure that it's a fair game, those referees wear a different jersey. Could you imagine the outrage and the anger if one of those referees had the jersey of the other team on? Or if they had a hat with just the other team's logo? Nobody would stand for that. You see, as a church, we have an opportunity to see ourselves not as belonging to one of the competing sides. Not as wearing the jersey of a Democrat or wearing the jersey of a Republican, but wearing the jersey of God's officiating team. And as God's officiating team, whether it's stated or not by a governor or somebody of importance, the church is essential. And it has nothing to do with man's word. The church is essential because God says we are essential. And whether or not we can gather legally or illegally, that doesn't matter. We're still essential because God has said, I want to work my plan of redemption in the world through my officiating team, through the refs, through the church. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 28, Jesus, after his resurrection, he says, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Jesus commissions us. He commissions you to go and to make disciples of all the nations, to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, and to teach, and to teach everything that Jesus taught us. And then he gives us a promise that he is with us to the very end of the age. We are the body of Christ. We are essential. And as Christians, as a part of God's officiating team, we are there to help bring order out of the chaos. And we can do that by pointing people to Jesus. Christians, please don't add more chaos to the chaos. You know, one of the ways that... Christians sometimes can be guilty of adding chaos to the chaos. Do you want a specific example? Yes. <laughs> Facebook, yeah, sure, that's part of it. Christians, we have to be careful when it comes to sharing things like conspiracy theories. I love a good conspiracy theory. But you know, one of the things that I was taught by my parents, which I'm sure they were taught by their grandparents, that I think applies to this, is that if something is too good to be true... It's probably not true. If you're sharing something from a new site you've never heard of, or just a guy's name, you might want to be double-checking things. You see, we're called to represent the truth. We're called to bring order out of the chaos, not create more chaos by this, sharing things that maybe have a little bit of truth in them, but are a lie. I mean, don't you guys remember that that is exactly the game that the serpent played with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? There was a little bit of truth in what he said to them, that you'll be like God if you eat this. That's a little bit of truth to that, but the other truth to that was that they already were like God. You asked for it. Not really, but... As a part of God's officiating team, we have a different playbook that guides us, that instructs us, that we follow. And this playbook was handed down from a higher authority, God himself, as he spoke through men and women. And this playbook helps us make sense out of the things that are going on in life. It helps us to understand God's purpose and what God wants to do. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're told this about scripture, that it's God breathed, it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible I have come to love and to cherish and I've grown hungry for more and more of Scripture. This is our playbook. This is what's guiding us. This is what's directing us as a part of God's officiating team. Psalm 119 105 says, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Think about the clarity that God's word can bring to your overall purpose. To what God's up to in our world. Does it guide you? Jesus says in John 17, 17, sanctify them by truth. Your word is truth. Have you ever thought about how God works through the reading and the studying and the memorizing of his word to make us look more and more like Jesus? Jesus. 
as a part of God's officiating team, we have moments where we are going to be loved. Where we're going to make the right call and people are going to cheer and scream and they're going to be excited. Some of those moments, to be specific, you know, when you hear those stories, you see those churches, those stories about churches paying off the medical debt of an entire community. Millions of dollars. That's one of those moments where the world says, yes, we love the church. Woo! All right, that's exciting. I've even heard of a church in northern Indiana that has a passion for single moms. And so much so that they did a single mom's oil change. Where they took care of these single moms, blessed them, gave to them, and gave and gave. That's when the world cheers. That's when the world says, yes, we love you. But there are other moments where we're going to be hated. Where we're going to say, you know what? Life, we believe life is from the womb to the tomb. We believe in life, the life that is growing inside of a mother. And that life is valuable. That life is precious. And just as much as any person, no matter their age or how smart they are, that life inside a mother's stomach is made in the image and likeness of God. And that life matters. And so we want to work to do what we can to eliminate abortions. We want to do what we can to make sure that those that don't want a baby have a way to give their baby to someone. But as we call abortion sin, it's one of those moments where we're hated, where we're booed. We have other moments where the church stands up and says, you know what? We believe that marriage is between a man and a woman for life. Those are moments where the world looks at us and says, ah, boo, horrible call. But maybe more so than the moments where we're loved and the moments where we're hated, there are certainly a lot of moments where we are just ignored. I mean, when's the last time you went to a sports memorabilia store and said, hey, just wondering, you guys got that 2020 rep jersey? Do you wait? Do you wait with excitement to watch the referees run out onto the field? Do you even notice the referees are on the field? When there's a bad call, you notice. When there's a bad call, it's the ref's fault. When it's a good call, it was our team. I mean, our team's awesome. Greatest quarterback and receiver ever. Most of the time, we're going to be ignored. I mean, think about it. Jesus, think about Jesus' life. The King of Kings, the Messiah, the one we've all been waiting for. He shows up, and what's the best we can do? Hey, my wife and I are about to have a baby. It's the Messiah, it's the Christ. Oh. Hmm. Uh, what kind of fold here? Well, I'll tell you what, there is a barn out back. I think it's in a cave. If you just... Sh Shove some of that animal stuff aside. I think it'd be a great place for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to be born. I mean, think about how we treated Jesus. Think about how there were moments in Jesus' life where people loved him. It usually involved him feeding people. And then there were moments where people hated him. It usually involved him teaching and speaking. And there were things that were hard for people to get. There were challenges to people. And people said, nah, we don't want any of that. And they walked away from him. They didn't give him their full attention. That is just what happens sometimes. But that is not to stop us. That's not to stop you, church, from continuing the mission to love Jesus and to love people. We are, as a part of God's officiating team, we are ambassadors. Christ. We represent Jesus. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 20, we are therefore Christ ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. You are an ambassador of Christ. You represent Christ. If you understand the, the role of an ambassador, when they go to another country, the things that they say, the things that they do, the interactions that they have, all represent whatever country they are from. And it's as if that, own, that country is there doing it themselves. It's as if that country is there is speaking these things. You are an ambassador of Christ. You represent Christ in what you do, in what you say. As a part of God's officiating team, we are called to wear a different jersey. 
We aren't called to wear the jersey of the Republicans. We aren't called to wear the jersey of the Democrats. We aren't called to wear the jersey of the Libertarians. We are called to wear a different jersey. And we are called to set our personal preferences, our personal opinions aside for the sake of carrying out God's mission of winning the loss to him. We are called to set aside our personal opinion and preferences for the sake of love. Think about that. You know, that's kind of hard to do. It's kind of hard to recruit somebody to your side when you're wearing the jersey of the other side. When someone asks us, there's a great opportunity here for us church to give some very thoughtful answers. When someone asks us, whose side are you on? We can answer like the angel of the Lord answered Joshua, neither. I'm a part of something bigger. I'm a part of something better that's going on. I'm a part of God's officiating team. You're going to have to push yourself here, church. This is tough for us to hear, tough for us to think about, tough for us to process, maybe. Maybe one of the things can help us is to remember that our citizenship is in heaven. That first and foremost, we belong to God's kingdom. We're told in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Something else that I think can help us during this time is to put our things, our, our desires for what happens in the realm of politics aside and to worship God. Maybe what we need to do more than anything right now is to gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ and worship Jesus. On Tuesday, on Wednesday morning, maybe what you need to do before you flip on the news, before you read the paper, is spend a moment worshiping Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2 says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand, the throne of God. I've asked the praise team to come, and as part of our conclusion this morning, I wanted to give us a chance to worship, to fix our eyes on Jesus. As they're coming, I want to just remind you, those of you that are still thinking about voting, those of you that maybe have not done that yet, consider what John Wesley shares with us. Consider his advice on voting. Vote for the person that you judge most worthy. Speak no evil of the person or persons you vote against. And take care that your spirits are not sharpened against those that voted on the other side. It's just some great advice when it comes to deciding who's going to win in an election. Deciding how we are going to vote. Church, I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. We're going to spend a moment here worshiping God through singing. It's one of the ways that we can worship. The kids are downstairs this morning learning how we can worship God through obedience. There are many ways in which we can worship God. Next week, we're going to be back again with, can we talk about this in church? And we're going to be talking about a different perspective. We're going to go a little bit further into what it is that God is focused on, what it is that God cares about when it comes to kings and presidents. To join the worship team and sing this morning.